All right, it is 6.04 p.m. April 20th, 2020. And I am calling this uh, special meeting the police commission to order. Um, you meant 2022, right? 2022, yes, my apologies, sorry about that. Um, and it looks like we have a quorum here, everyone's present, minus you all. Uh, in addition to Hayley McClenahan and Anthony Irapino. I hope I got that correctly. My apologies. That's close enough. Close enough. All right, I'll take it. Uh, and also Shannon present. Um, let's see, any additions or modifications to the agenda? No. Not seeing or hearing any. Um, with that, I, I motion to adopt the agenda as is. Do I have a second? Second. Seconded by Susie. All in favor, raise your hand or say aye. 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 Passes unanimously. Um, moves us on to agenda item 2.01, which is the public forum. Um, if, Shannon, I'm not sure if you received any emails from anybody looking to speak. No, well, sir. All right. In that case, if there's anybody in the attendees that would like to speak, please raise your hand and we will commit you to a panelist so you can speak. Not seeing any hands raised. Um, if any questions arise, put them into the little chat box and I hope I see them and I'll get to them. Um, with that, we move on to agenda item 3.01, which is drafting response to the ordinance on police accountability and oversight. And uh, with that, uh, I give the floor to Stephanie. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> so I'd just like to lay out the process of what we're doing tonight. Uh, we've been asked to provide comments on a draft ordinance <clears throat> relating to the authority of the police commission that is in response to city council re resolution passed uh, this past fall and approved by the city council and mayor. Uh, and so that ordinance is meant to codify what was in the resolution. And uh, so the city attorney shared with us that draft ordinance uh, a week or two ago. We, I believe, are the first to be reviewing it. And so the purpose of this meeting is to uh, ensure that we have all of the feedback uh, from all commissioners uh, with regard to our feedback on the ordinance. And from this, we will draft a memo to the city council and the city attorney. And we will vote on that as a motion at our meeting on Tuesday night. So. The purpose of this is to hear people's input. And the way um, we'd like to proceed is to, given that I have been uh, given comments from several commissioners, what I'd like to do is to go through the ordinance step by step and share with you the, the feedback I have gotten. And then there will be an opportunity for commissioners to provide any other feedback and any other discussion we want to have. Uh, I think that the most efficient way of doing this is probably going to be uh, point by point in the ordinance. And so that means that when I talk about the first section, I'll share the comments. And at that moment, I uh, will ask if anybody has any additional comments or disagreement with the comments. Uh, so with that, I will begin. Uh, I think it may be useful to highlight for the public what was in the city council resolution and uh, there are approximately 12 points that are made in that resolution. And I'll try to very quickly go through those. Uh, Shereen? Yeah, thanks, Stephanie. I like this approach. I'm wondering if we want someone to share the screen of the resolution or of the ordinance so that when you are oh. speaking, we can follow along. Sure, yeah, great idea. Um, would I have authority to share, Shannon? Yes, you should. Okay. Um, down at the bottom of the screen. Yep, I, I just, uh, let me get there. I am looking at share screen. And then I'm trying to find the right document. There we go, how's that? Perfect, okay. thank you so much. Great, so uh, before that, this is the ordinance that everyone sees. And I don't have up 
the city council resolution, but it is on board docs that I'm just gonna quickly summarize the major points of this. Uh, it codifies, the, the ordinance, co uh, I'm sorry, the resolution codifies that the commission will review all complaints submitted. The commission, secondly, the commission will determine what level the complaint is, low, medium, or high, uh, which then would influence which complaints are investigated. The commission is given full and unfettered access to the department's documentation of the incident, including officer affidavits, witness statements, investigative documents, and all videos. The commission also has the authority to retain outside legal counsel to support independent review of complaints. The commission is given authority to investigate the chief or another appropriate authority and requires that any report of findings be returned to the commission. The commission has the authority to review incidents to determine if we will investigate a complaint irrespective of the chief of the department. Uh, we are also authorized to give input and make recommendations on investigation results and remedies, including proposed discipline of officers. The commission has the authority to recommend remedy for the complaints, including discipline. That may be repetitive on my part. My apologies. The mayor, city council, public safety committee, and independent third body would lead resolution of disagreement on dis disposition of complaints. Uh, the commission is tasked with uh, providing an annual report on complaints, including our recommendations and final disposition of complaints. The commission, uh, the, the uh, city council allocates $25,000 budget for the commission for legal services and investigation. And the commission is authorized to initiate audits, reviews and evaluations of policies, directives or data in regard to discipline, racial disparities and other commission priorities. So very quick fashion, uh, that was the ordinance. Um, so to begin, uh, I'm gonna start with section XX1, uh, section A. Uh, I recognize the audience may not have read this, but I'm gonna proceed because the commissioners have. Uh, and so the comment that I've received on part A here is that the civilian oversight agency's complaint jurisdiction should cover internal complaints, not simply citizen complaints. And that is, uh, it should cover complaints filed by officers or deputies within the overseeing law enforcement agency to provide officers with a neutral and independent outlet for reporting officer misconduct and alleged retaliation for reporting misconduct. And pause for a moment and ask if anybody has anything to add, differs. Good as okay. is. Okay. Uh, Part B, uh, this, this uh, designates the number of commissioners and the cons two, two concerns have been raised. One is that this should indicate that terms are staggered so that we have institutional memory. And a concern has also been raised about the number of commissioners and whether in fa fact seven is adequate. Um, that may depend on uh, the staff that has been allocated to the commission uh, uh, and uh, I'm not sure that we can resolve this now, but I think we can at least flag this as an issue. Uh, and I wanna just ask Commissioner Hart, who was one of the people who commented on this, if, if I captured correctly what your concern was and if there's anything else I should add. I think that's it. It was, it was expanded from five to seven in 2016, which I appreciate. Oh. And I think, um, you know, we'll know, it might be that we revisit this. It has to be revisited in a year or two once we better understand what our rule is going to look like, our more expanded rule. Thanks, Stephanie. Great. So we will have we have flagged that, and uh, we'll leave that in there that way. Then, okay. Uh, on to XX two, uh, Part A. The only change suggested was in the third line of Part A, which says that the um, the policy, we, we can review and evaluate and audit policies and directives for their impact on police community relations. And, and the request was to insert and public safety. Uh, I'm gonna ask because I have this on my screen and I can't see everybody if, oh, I see Anthony has his hand up. That was just my concern. Go ahead, Anthony. Oh, sorry, I meant to lower it, um, but I okay. just did wanna point out and flat, but um, section 1B, um, I think it's important to distinguish between recommendations for the ordinance and recommendations for the future going forward. And 
under uh, the charter, we're stuck with seven until the charter changes, but the charter doesn't say anything about staggered terms. So um, that I think could be done by ordinance and the number just in terms of our recommendation, I think it's valid to make recommendations that speak to both the ordinance as drafted as well as charter changes the commission thinks are needed. I just wanna make sure we're clear about distinguishing between the two when we communicate our feedback. Thank you, that's really helpful. Going on to um, XX2, no comments on part B, comments on part C are as follows. And that is uh, the uh, is a request to strike the last section of this phrase, everything from except onwards. In other words, the chief of police shall incorporate recommended changes to policies and the remainder of that should is recommended to be deleted um, for several reasons that were offered. First of all, the chief should own or take responsibility for the response to the commission's recommendations rather than being outsourced, if you will, to other authorities. Uh, and in particular, um, uh, uh, a couple of things here, let me just say that the recommendation that the city attorney review the uh, and, and clear our recommendations is perceived to be a conflict of interest because the, the, city, the city attorney represents the city, the FISC as it were, and uh, th there may be a conflict of interest in reviewing those, rec those proposed um, revisions of policy. Uh, second of all, referring us to what is best practice followed by a majority of Vermont municipalities is um, problematic in that many municipalities are in fact further behind Burlington in terms of police reform. Uh, and um, so therefore, if, if there were a best practices clause, it should, recommend, it should reference NACOL's best practices. You move Stop there for a moment. Go ahead. We can't see it on the screen. Could you move the... Uh... Uh, oh, so sorry, I'm looking at the wrong document. Here we go. Uh, let's see, XX2. So it's uh, section C here that I'm referring to. I will say the following, that if uh, you do think of something that we can come back to it at the end of this, just make a note to yourself and we can come back and revisit any of these at the end. Uh, okay, in section D, the uh, recommendation for change is that in, to replace in a timely manner with 15 days. So in other words, to delineate carefully uh, the, um, what is timely, if you will. Uh, there should also be a process to request for an extension, for the chief to request an extension. And this request should be made public and should be accompanied by an explanation for the need of an extension. I want to go slow enough that everybody can absorb this. Uh, so I'm just taking my time. But uh, if you need me to go slower, please just let me know. I'm happy to do that. Uh, part E, again, referencing the issue of the commission's input and revision of policies, directives, and so on and so forth. Um, I have two documents open too, so I'm a little struck, just uh, working hard to keep track of them all here. Um, uh, in this particular case, one of the comments was that any letter by the chief uh, in which he or she rejects or substantially modifies the commission's recommendations, that letter should be delivered at least one, in, one week in advance of the next regularly scheduled meeting to give the commission opportunity to thoroughly review it. Uh, and second of all, uh, a, the comment was made and also uh, the comment was made that the mechanism described in part E 
uh, to reconcile differences on policy recommendations is beyond what most other oversight bodies have. This was a comment that NACOL made to us on the draft ordinance. And uh, so the recommendation is that this section be revised and the revision should be based on a review of what other ordinances across the country do, especially review bodies such as ours, uh, in, in terms of how such conflict, conflicts are resolved. Part F um, refers to the draft ordinance suggesting that any difference in opinion on the revision of ordinances should be appealed to the mayor. Uh, the comment on this is that uh, the section, this section should be removed or revised based on a review of other ordinances on how this type of issue is handled. In, and in any case, a simple majority of the commission would be sufficient to recommend a, to, to request an appeal. Uh, since this is merely a request to appeal, it's not a final decision of any particular uh, policy. Uh, and so parts G, H, G and H uh, are recommended to be removed in light of this as well. And I would say not removed and revised, depending upon a review of what other ordinances across the country do in terms of resolving this kind of conflict. Stephanie, can I just ask for a clarification? Yep. So our, the comment the commission is contemplating um, under section two, subsection C, is that everything after the accept clause be stricken. So just to clarify, a lot of these following sections wouldn't come into play at all if the recommendation by the commission is that the accept clause is stricken. So, so in making recommendations, you're saying the commission's preference is to strike the accept clause and all that follows from it. But if that's not followed and you stick with these other provisions about how to implement and resolve disputes between the commission and the chief, then we're also offering recommendations to improve these Th that process. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, yes. I, I mean, I think we're trying to do, I think we're trying to do two things. I think we're making recommendations and sometimes our recommendation, I mean, it, our comments here might not be accepted and therefore we would want to offer some alternative language if in fact this, this, we stick to this. Does that make sense? Yeah, I just it, that's what I thought was the case, but I'm not sure that everyone was following that, so I just wanted to Okay. Thanks. Call that and out. Actually, and on reflection, uh it it's, it makes sense that uh, actually all of C is stricken because absent the rest of the phrase, it doesn't make sense that the chief automatically has to incorporate our comments. So I think actually C could be struck in, in its entirety and then we would move on to D in which the chief of police um if the chief of police disagrees with our recommendations, we develop a process for resolving that difference. I, I wanna uh, just say to everybody as well that we, we aren't really fine tuning this in terms of wordsmithing it. We are just giving recommendations and uh, there's a lot of complexity in reaching a final ordinance. So I'm not too concerned that we uh, are wordsmithing every single change that we're suggesting here, but just giving the broad strokes of where we think that there needs to be further work and it needs to go back to the drawing board versus where we don't have any comments. Um, okay, moving on to XX3. Uh, this regards uh, the commission writing an annual report. Uh, I had several comments on this. Uh, one is that the commission already writes an annual report each year, and it has been published in July of each year, as do other commissions. 
and therefore November uh, stipulating November seems out of sync. Uh, yeah. Further, there was a comment that this type of detail in the ordinance doesn't permit the necessary flexibility in carrying out the commission's work. There may be issues with regard to getting data that influence uh, when we can issue our annual report. There may be delays, uh, but it, it, it seems uh, that it would be it would be useful in terms of adding needed flexibility to not stipulate the month that the, the annual report is due. Uh, a second comment I had is that the policy, the, com uh, the comp complaint policy should guide the preparation of such reports as regards confidentiality uh, and that the city attorney's role in this is not necessary in the preparation of this report uh, to the extent that the commission needs advice, it should be supported by conflict counsel rather than the city attorney. And uh, it wasn't clear, it, it, it's a little bit ambiguous in this ordinance, but I think it, uh, one of the comments was that it should clearly state that the report uh, has been and should continue to be a public document. So far so good? Yes. All right. Uh, let's see. Okay. Uh, another comment here was that uh, the, the commission in its annual report uh, will denote the nature of complaints, the, the chief's disposition of the complaints and whether the commission was in agreement or not in agreement with the disposition of the complaint. And uh, it was requested that the chief provide a written response as to why or why not he or she disagrees with commission findings on complaints and those responses should become public in annual reports. But the argument that this is key to transparency and accountability and also designates the independent role of the commission. Okay. Going on to XX4, part uh, A. Um, it says a complaint by the public uh, hereafter referred to as a citizen complaint um, may be filed and then some language about the filing of the complaint. Uh, there's a recommendation that we delete the term citizen because commission uh, has had and should continue to have a role on complaints that are filed internally by officers as I mentioned, we mentioned earlier. Uh, and that furthermore that I think there's a general sense that the commission really should designate the complaint process itself, that this is too much detail and uh, that the commission is still learning with regard to the process and how to make it more effective. And so uh, the recommendation is that we maintain the current practice and policy in which all commissioners receive complaints at the same time as the police department and uh, we should add language to provide a process by which the commission receives transcripts of verbal complaints to the police department within three days. And it should also accommodate the possibility that there are co-chairs of the commission. So in other words, this isn't entirely consistent with the structure of the commission where we now have two co-chairs and a vice chair. I have a, I have a question on this section. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> On section C, uh, and uh, or um, yeah, section C, the chair and vice chair of the police commission shall s screen each citizen complaint and, if appropriate, present the, them to the commission for review. But right now, Kevin, we're kind of I'm sorry to, Kevin. Do you mind? So I want to just do B first, and then we'll oh, okay. come to C. Is that right? All right. Okay. I just didn't want to skip over it. No, I'm not going to skip. I promise. <laughs> okay. Uh, so B. Um, it says that the, here it, it changes the purpose of the commission's review of citizen complaints from the city council resolution and from the current complaint policy. Uh, and so the comment is that this section, part B, deviates from the current complaint policy, which was authorized and sanctioned by the police chief and then city attorney, and that the role of a review oversight body such as ours 
is to review the disposition of complaints on both in terms of both policy, but also in terms of discipline. And therefore the ordinance should reflect this role with the commission's purpose being to weigh in on disciplinary issues and in particular to identify cases in which policies were not followed. Yes. Okay. Um, part C, go ahead, Kevin. Yeah, so as I'm reading this, um, I think right now we're, we're kind of like set up where all commissioners receive complaints and we can also ask for body cam footage if we need to. Um, but here it's just saying like on under C that the chair and vice chair of the police commission should screen each citizen complaint. And we're not really doing that right now. I think we all kind of have a play a role um, in what complaints we want to, you know, talk about. So I think we need to restructure that somehow okay. to kind of like have it work as it does now, mm -hmm. um, the way we're doing things now, I think. Uh, okay, that sounds good. And it's consistent with some other language uh, I had gotten. So here's what I've written down that I think incorporates what you're saying, Kevin. Let me know if it doesn't. Uh, the commission should determine its own process for triage of complaints. The full commission receives all complaints now and that should continue. It should be the collective decision of commissioners on which complaints to review or not to ex exclude the commissioners from complaints that may have disciplinary implications would essentially undermine and negate the role of a civilian oversight body. That covers Perfect. it. Is that okay? Great. Yeah, it's great. Um, and so let me just see if I've got C here covered. Uh, I have a note to myself I'm not, uh, that this paragraph, if the chair and vice chair refer a citizen complaint to the chief of police um, and also seek to refer the complaint to the commission, and so forth. Uh, I have in my notes that as per above, this should be struck. I um, am not convinced of that, I'm not sure of that, but it is something I can at least note and talk to Anthony about. Uh, I'm, uh, there's some details here I may not be capturing. Uh, if you don't mind, I'll just move on from that. I think we don't have to, you know, as I said, dot every I and cross every T on this. I think we're doing this in broad strokes. So if you're okay, I'll move on from that. Just one one quick point. If, yes. Um, that may be contract related to. Uh-huh. Just FYI. Uh -huh. And there is some language that we have in our current complaint policy about this. And I just, uh, one of the broad um, comments from several commissioners is that these, an ordinance like this, just like the city charter, should be in broad strokes and the details of how we conduct our business should be in our policies. And so this, this may fall into that category. Okay. Um, moving on to section D. This is a long one. Uh, and it actually is similar to what I just said. So here's the comment that I've written on this. Again, because this is delineating how we conduct our business. And so what I have so far is, while it is useful to have the complaint process outlined in detail, the commission is in the process of, re of revising uh, the complaint policy based on our experience in the last two years. Defining the process is the role of the commission and should not appear in the ordinance since by so doing it reduces the flexibility of the commission to revise processes as deemed necessary. So far, so good? Okay. Um, so in shorthand, it leaves us toothless. Uh-huh, right. Uh, and then the next uh, comment that I have on this is that the current complaint policy should be followed in regard to assessing the level of the complaint, low, medium, or high. High level complaints require an investigation. The city council resolution and best practice identifies the role of the commission in determining, in determining the level of the complaint 
uh, rather than the chief. Again, as an independent civilian oversight body whose goal it is to promote transparency, accountability, and trust, the commission's role should be able to request an investigation of any complaint, and in particular, those it deems high level. Most oversight agencies do investigations of all complaints. Yes. Good. Moving on to section E. Okay, moving on to section E. Um, this is one, the, this section refers to our ability to acquire information and uh, with regard to complaints and investigations and so forth. It said this section should be revised to reflect the city council resolution, which gives the commission unfettered access to any information the police department avails itself of in conducting investigations of complaints. The commission should have the opportunity to require an independent investigation if it sees fault with an investigation that, that the police department conducted. And, uh, and, and as Anthony noted, uh, I'm not going to speak for Anthony, actually, but in so far, uh, let me, I will speak for you, Anthony, if you don't mind, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but Anthony pointed out that given that the city council resolution um, authorizes legal services for us and a budget, that, that by virtue of that, we do have the authority to conduct investigations. I'm not sure how that would affect how this ordinance is written, uh, but that point is important. Can, Anthony, do you have any any thoughts on that on the spot? Uh, you're muted, sorry. Yeah, no, that I, I just wanted to point out and um, clarify, thank you, Stephanie, for the opportunity from your initial um, introduction of the topic that the resolution has sort of a two-tiered two structure. Part of the resolution says things that should be in the ordinance. Um, and so it's still left for an ordinance to be drafted and adopted for, for those um, authorities to the commission to come into effect. And then part of the resolution is immediately resolved. Um, mm. So things that don't require the ordinance for those powers granted to the commission to come to effect. And among those is um, that the commission uh, can use the $25,000 uh, unassigned fund balance uh, for legal costs and to conduct an independent investigation. So that that's right, Stephanie. It's just important that we keep an eye on the fact that some of the things are what the commission said should be in the ordinance, and some of the things are already resolved by the, the resolution and no further action or implementation by ordinance is necessary. Although that's not to say it might not be beneficial because the ordinance um, with regard to the in independent investigations and legal services is, is a FY 20 to um, power. So it's granted for this year and it might be beneficial for it to be further extended into other years by the ordinance. Great. Okay. Um, okay, moving on to part F. Uh, so this does refer to our access to information. The comment that I received is that uh, timely manner should be replaced with 10 days. Uh, let me just see what else I have written here. Uh, So I'll, I'll read what I have written and we could certainly obviously change this. So it says the commissioners have expressed an interest in moving towards best practice as defined by NACOL in which hearings on complaints are held in public session with appropriate step steps taken to protect, conf protect confidentiality as required by policies of the BPOA contract. As written, this section is at odds with the goal of transparency 
and should be revised to reflect best practices. I'll just ad lib here for a moment. And I think that this is one of those areas in which we probably need to do a little bit more background work. Uh, as I said, Nicole has said that a number of civilian oversight bodies do hold their complaint hearings in public, even though the identities of people are confidential. Uh, and it seems to me that that's something we'd want to further investigate to, to, to learn about how they do that and whether that's feasible here. But at least we could signal here the need for further research and uh, on what best practices are and how this might be conducted in a way that does provide greater accountability and transparency. I think that's important, Stephanie. I, I would say that, you know, the, uh, just to add to the state police as the SPAC, the State Police Advisory Committee, they sort of are like us, except all of their work is confidential. We never know what they do. And we don't know what the outcome of investigations is. And it seems to me that that's an example. This, this, the, the nature of this ordinance is moving us, uh, us in that direction. But the real request of the community has been around transparency and uh, to know that the commission is actually doing its job of providing oversight. Uh, and so I think it is useful for us to at least signal that we would like to move in this direction and to do the background research to see if in fact state law and all of the constraints on our work allow us to do this. I'm in complete agreement. <clears throat> yes, yeah, Stephanie, I would just yeah. observe for our comments that there, there is a reference in this section to the Vermont Public Records Act section 317, mm -hmm. but also in the Public Records Act is Section 318E, um, which is an instruction to any public agency not to withhold any record in its entirety on the basis that it contains some exempt contact um, content if the record is otherwise subject to disclosure. And instead, the agency shall redact the information it considers to be exempt. So there's also a policy in state law with regard to trying to strike a balance between sharing, you know, withholding information that is truly subject to some rights of confidentiality or, or other statutory or contractual provision, but giving the public access to as much of the document as um, is otherwise feasible and striking that balance. So I think our, our comment back should, um, reflect that policy, which is also part of um, the state law that is cited in the draft ordinance. Okay, that sounds great. I just made a note of that and we'll include that. Okay, moving on to G. Um, it says the commission votes by a majority to challenge any denial of access to the requested departmental information. Uh, the this, this is an issue, this has been an issue that it would appear that the city council resolution resolved, which is that it delineates that the commission shall have unfettered access to all information the BPT, BPD had when it made their disposition of the case. Uh, and therefore a request on our part that that be included in this ordinance. Um, and it's mentioned again, once again, that the city attorney being involved in this is a conflict of interest and therefore should not be an arbiter in any dispute about access to information. Uh, and as at a minimum, we could develop an MOU between the BPD and commission based on examples from other oversight bodies about information sharing. Going on, there were no comments that I got on H, which is up on the screen now. Uh, I believe also this may be in our complaint policy already. It may be worth looking again at our complaint policy and making sure that this level of detail may or may not be needed here. But in any case, there were no comments on this. So I'll just leave that as is. So under I, uh, it says commissioners shall not communicate with any complaint witnesses uh, and so on and so forth. All communication 
needs to uh, go through the commission staff, the city attorney or conflict council. The, um, there was a, a number of comments I got from all of you on this, and that is that the commission's practice is to communicate directly with complainants for three purposes, to acknowledge the complaint, to provide a copy of the complaint policy, and to provide updates on status of the complaint. Uh, and we would like to see the ordinance reflect that. Um, the, furthermore, the role of the city attorney in this, again, represents a conflict of interest and should be eliminated. And uh, finally, in a according to NACOL, uh, in part, the, this is practice that we developed is based on NACOL's advice. NACOL has said that the complaint process is more likely to be perceived as fair and transparent and transparent if complainants receive regular updates regarding their complaint and can obtain status updates at any time. Communicating with complainants by providing these updates uh, is one way of civilian oversight agencies assuring members of the public that they are in fact handling their complaints seriously and actively. Uh, and they further advise, and I think this is something we might want to include, that once a complaint has been adjudicated or after a disciplinary decision has been made, the civilian oversight agency should invite complainants to an in-person close-up meeting. And I'm gonna read something from NACOL uh, when they did review our complaint policy that they said about this. Uh, what they said is that close-out meetings allow the oversight agency to describe the investigative process, explain how and why decisions were made, and demonstrate that the complaint was resolved neutrally and impartially. In turn, this promotes legitimacy and public confidence in the oversight process. Closeout meetings furthermore provide the oversight agency with an opportunity to collect information regarding how complainants feel about the complaint process as a whole. Once a complaint has been adjudicated or a disciplinary decision has been made, the civilian oversight agency, well, then the, the, I'm repeating myself that there should be a, a closeout meeting. I wanna just check with everybody that um, the closeout piece is something from NACOL. It, I therefore included that because they did uh, suggest that. And I wanna just make sure that commissioners, this is consistent with commissioners views as well. Uh, I'm gonna assume if I don't hear anything, you're okay with it. Yes. I think, yes, um, I really strongly agree with that because <sighs> What we're doing now, we can spend a lot of time on something and then we're not really able to give additional information, which is very problematic and lacks transparency to a certain point. Thank you. I would also add that it supports healing on the part of the complainant, which I think is critical in this. Okay, uh, moving on to J. J. The commission shall draft findings, conclusions, and recommendations. Uh, the city attorney shall assist the commission in the creation of this report, and the report shall be transmitted to the mayor and chief of police. It should be considered an attorney-client document. The commission may allow a redacted version of any such report to become public without waiving the confidentiality of the underlying report. Uh, so the comments I received on this was that the city attorney should be um, deleted from this section again due to a conflict of interest. Um, such reports should continue as they have been uh, to be developed with the input of conflict counsel only, who shall provide guidance on redaction for purposes of making, making findings public. Uh, K, the commission shall not make any disciplinary recommendations for individual officers in the report, but the commission may make recommendations regarding the development or revision of policy and directives. The major concern with this uh, was articulated at our last meeting, and that is that in reviewing some complaints, the issues are not, not only that there may be flaws in the policies and directives, but that policies and directives may not have been followed. And uh, so recognizing that there are complexities here that we can't resolve with regard to uh, state law, the city charter and so on and so forth, this is what I have. Uh, the commission should be able to recommend coaching for officers who are the subject of complaints 
and should be able to provide feedback on proposed discipline. The Commission should also have the explicit authority to audit policies and directives, including the ability to audit discipline. That last comment is a little bit out of place. It probably should go to the place where we talk about reports and audits, but it, it, um, it, the, the, the recommendation was that we be able to audit discipline. And by that, Anthony, I'm gonna ask for your help on this, but by that, my understanding is that, that we should be able to review discipline in uh, disciplinary dis disposition of cases, the discipline allocated to make sure that officers are being treated fairly. In other words, that one officer doesn't get greater discipline than another officer for the same infraction and so on and so forth. Uh, so that the idea here is then to make explicit that our, our role is also to audit discipline more generally. Yeah, this is another area where I would distinguish in the resolution between instructions that the resolution gives to the city attorney's office to draft an ordinance and authority that the resolution has already given to the um, commission. And one of the resolved clauses in the resolution without any reference to fiscal year 2022 is the uh, authorization of the police commission to initiate audits, reviews, and evaluations of policies, directives, or data in regard to discipline, racial disparities, or other uh, commission priorities. So yeah, I, I agree with what you said and would point out that this is one of the ones where we have to struggle a little bit with the tension between what authority you've already been granted by the resolution and what whether the ordinance is um, appropriately altering that authority or not. Thanks, that's helpful. Uh, and so one, I think one final comment on this is that the following sentence should be deleted. The commission may recommend that the police, chief of police conduct an internal affairs investigation based on the report. And the reason for uh, requ suggesting that this be deleted is that as this is currently written, it would require the commission to make decisions before an investigation is actually done. So it seems that the cart is before the horse here, right? That it's saying that we can provide a report on a complaint uh, and then we can recommend that an internal affairs investigation be conducted and it should be the other way around. The commission needs as many facts as possible when determining next steps in a case and therefore uh, uh, access to that information based on an investigation should be available to the commission prior to issuing a report on any complaint. Hearing, hearing no comments, I'll move on to L. Um, there seems to be an odd word here in the, this, the second sentence. Uh, so suggest that we delete short, uh, where it says that um, if the chief does not, the chief shall note the recommendations not being adopted and on a short basis for why they are not being implemented. I'm not sure what the short is, just suggested it be deleted. Uh, also requiring a majority vote for the commission to respond to the chief's decision goes beyond what should be in an ordinance. This should be part of the commission's complaint policy and procedures. Uh, and it should include a phrase that indicates the mayor will inform the commission of the reasons for his or her decision with regard to the adoption of the commission's findings. So as you all recall, earlier this year, we presented findings to the mayor on two different complaints, but we have not received any feedback on what the, the mayor's dis, um, actions were in response to our findings. And so this would request that the mayor inform the commission of how he or she re responds to our findings. Does it need to have some kind of a time asso associated with it? Uh, yes, Probably, that's a good point. Um, I'll just think about it with uh, Anthony when we draft this memo in Jabu and we'll <clears throat> draft a, a, a number of days or whatever seems reasonable there. Thanks, Susie. So I had, um, let's see. 
So going on to X, X5, Uh, I'm, um, there should be some comments here, but they're somehow missing from my file right now. So I'm just going to sit here with a minute with all of you to just uh, skim through this and see if I can come up with what we had thought on this. Um, Well, a little itty bitty thing is selected by the co-chairs. Uh, where are you in this? A, B, C, or D? Sorry. Uh, let's see. I'm sorry, X, X, five. I was in B. We, could, we could just go section by section here. Okay. So are you referring to? I'm in B, so we'll go to A first. OK. Uh, I, I think my feeling about this way, and is that in some ways we've dealt with some of this in our other comments. And this section would likely, if, if our comments were accepted, this section would likely be revised. The one piece here that is, um, that there was a comment on uh, is regards the issue of the commission hearing grievances. And in particular, the comment is, and, and this is from some commissioners, so it'll be important to make sure that we all are in agreement here. The commission's role in the grievance, grievance process should be eliminated. Uh, there's only been one hearing on a grievance held in the last six years. As a rare event, this should be conducted by another body so that the commission does not have a conflict of interest in hearing disciplinary cases. What body would that be? I think that would be up for the city to determine. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure that we need to sort that out ourselves. Agreed. Can I just make a couple comments here, <clears throat> Stephanie? Mm -hmm. So this is one of these places, and I think city attorney did identify this in, an, in uh, it's the city attorney's memo to the city council before the resolution was adopted. And I also think is called out in the mayor's uh, signing statement on the resolution. We do have some tension here. And I, I, again, it's a question of what can be changed by ordinance and what needs to be changed in the charter. And unfortunately, the police commissioner's appellate role is in the charter. And so I would just ask the commissioners to think about what I think what's the balance that's trying to be struck in this draft, these draft sections here that we're talking about is actually expanding the commission's role in the disciplinary process in a way that doesn't compromise the appellate role that you're stuck with currently under the charter. So I think it's important to call out that the commission doesn't feel like, you know, its appellate role is as important as this involvement in the disciplinary process. And that's where we want to go in the future. But I'd ask you to think about in, under the present reality that you're stuck with under the charter, whether this might actually not be a way of allowing the commission greater role, not the full commission, but some members of the commission so that there are other members left to be involved in the grievance process without violating you know, due process. Um, but the other issue I wanted to bring up is, I, and I'm new to this, so I could be wrong and I could be missing something, but um, the, um, the question of the appellate jurisdiction um, you know, the, the, to hear, you know, if, the, if, if the, someone appeals the chief's disciplinary decision, 
I, I think the assumption has always been that it's just the officer that can appeal that, but I'm having a hard time finding that in the charter. To me, the charter at section 180 or 190 just says the board of police commissioners shall hear any appeal filed in a timely manner with respect to such actions of the police chief. It doesn't necessarily say, uh, that that appeal right is exclusive to officers who are being disciplined. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't know if you've ever gotten an opinion on that for the city attorney, but in some ways, if, if that were true, if the complainant could also appeal to the commission, then this authority could be actually more valuable than it has heretofore been recognized by both the commission itself and members of the community who are concerned about their interactions with police. So... Uh, just to clarify, you're saying that the city charter doesn't is not clear on who can grieve, and that we should ask for an opinion on that. Well, I'm wondering if you've ever been um, given an opinion on that. I, uh, Shireen is the longest serving member. Um, I don't know if she had to step away. Jabu, do you? Here. Steph, I'm here. Okay. Yeah, I'm not aware of that. Um, but again, it's only six years out of many, many years. But um, I am not aware of that issue ever having been raised. It's an interesting one. I know. And, and I'll just jump in, Stephanie. My historical perspective, as you folks know, is pretty limited. But to my knowledge, based on the documents that Dan has prepared on this issue, I don't think he's explicitly addressed that possibility that I'm aware of. So that would be something that we should ask for clarification on? Okay. I think so, because I think it may, I think it may affect the extent to which you view these, what the, what the city attorney's office is trying to do in this ordinance and expanding your role, but also maintaining due process. And if the assumption is that that due process is just for an officer who's been disciplined, but that also might be due process for a citizen complainant um, who, who might access your appellate jurisdiction. It's a question that we should at least get the answer to before you, or, or call out for mm -hmm. to be answered um, so that your comments on this section can be appreciated in the, that broader context of, you know, I know, I think what you've said is historically, it's always just been an officer grieving. Mm -hmm. But maybe that's an assumption that everyone in the community has made that's not actually consistent with what the charter means. Mm -hmm. That's that's really helpful. And so maybe the best thing to do then is just to leave this section as is to raise those questions and to you know uh, request revision based on the answer to those questions. Mm -hmm. What I like about it a lot is that it, it you know, speaks to the equity issue mm -hmm. in the complaint and process. Uh-huh, uh-huh, right. Okay. Okay, I think I'm ready to move on to confidentiality of, um, uh, oops, sorry. I, so I just am scrolling through this because I'm not sure that we have any specific comments on uh, A through D here other than what we just discussed. And if not, I'll move on to confidentiality of records, section XX6. Um, I want to ask Shireen, because you articulated it so well, if you'd like to um, restate your concern about this section. I'm looking for it. Yeah, so it, in, in section oh. B in particular, is that correct? B, just, I, well, it's the very final sentence. A violation shall constitute negligence or bad conduct regardless of the nature of the breach, the intent of the breaching commissioner or the impact of such a breach. My concern there is if one of us hits reply all 
as opposed to reply. I mean, it, it can be so innocently done that I, I wouldn't want to sign something like this. You know, I do think intent matters. Um, so this definitely merits more of a look. There may be those who don't have an issue, but I think this would be a hard thing for folks to sign on to in taking on a voluntary role. I have no problem with us. You know, I think we would all agree that an intentional breach or disclosure in violation of confidentiality rules or understandings we have is one thing, but when you've done something innocently with no intent, um, I think that matters. Okay, thanks. And so I have some language here to that effect. Um, and just to remind everybody that we did get, we, we are uh, going to develop a code of ethics that would incorporate some of this. Um, I think there's also a question as to whether, so, the, so here's the point, we, we may recommend that we retain the first sentence of part D and strike the rest. We may recommend that we keep all of it except the last sentence. Uh, I think there's an interesting question as to whether um, suspending a commissioner and holding a hearing, hearing is the appropriate response and whether that should be left to the commission in its own code, in its code of ethics rather than in the ordinance. And I'd be happy to hear your thoughts on that. So I have a question. Do, mm -hmm. do city employees, are they under the same standard? No mistakes allowed? Haley, do you know? It depends on the employee. Um, so for uh, police officers, it's a lot different. The standards for removal are outlined in the charter. For department heads, um, same kind of a thing. They're entitled to process before city council. Um, but just for everyday run-of-the-mill employees, that's generally governed by our employee handbook. And, you know, there is a provision in there for, you know, there's sort of a sliding scale of discipline and, and almost across the board, you know, for really bad conduct, uh, a one-off uh, incident, even if the employees had a really good track record before, can be grounds for, for termination um, in some instances. Um, but I, I'm not aware of this sort of, um, I, I'm not aware of anything in the city charter or in the employee handbook that has this sort of per se, you know, language in it that it doesn't matter what your intent was kind of a thing. Now it's possible in certain circumstances, it could be applied that way if it was a really, really, you know, grievous error, but I'm not aware of any language that exists in, in other parts of at least employment with the city, which is a little bit different, right? And Anthony, I'm, I'm sure would <laughs> have a little bit more um, insight on that, but, you know, employment versus serving on a board is a little bit different, but, but for, um, you know, for employment anyway, I, I am not aware of anything that has language that's so strict. Yeah, this, this feels punitive to me. Which I don't it's appreciate. Way to me too, you know, same here. Yeah. It seems draconian, doesn't it? I mean, yes. to have a volunteer to the police commission have to appear for a hearing without any regard for intent on yes. what led to it. I agree it. wholeheartedly, Shireen. Uh, Haley, do you know, for example, let's just say that there is a, a department head or that has, um, there's a hearing based on a violation of code of ethics. Uh, are they temporarily suspended until that hearing? Again, it really depends on, on it's really fact um, dependent, Stephanie. I can say, you know, generally what the city's practice is for higher level, higher level concerns are that the employee would be, pay, would be placed on administrative leave or temporary, you know, temporary leave. The, an, invest, an internal investigation would be conducted. And then at the conclusion of that, the employee would have the opportunity for a hearing. Okay, so what I have here uh, is um, uh, actually use the same word that Shireen did, that the draconian language on holding a hearing if a person even inadvertently violates the code 
is problematic and that this portion of the ordinance should be struck retaining only the first sentence of part D. I think we probably should come to some agreement on that. I think we're all in agreement that the last sentence should be struck. Uh, another possibility is that we request a review of what other commissions do in terms of codes of ethics in, in Burlington. In other words, to have consistency across commissions about how this is handled, how the, any violation of the code is, um, is responded to. Does that seem reasonable to folks? Well, I, I have so. a question. I believe so. I'm sorry, does any, Susie. Does any other commission have a code of ethics? Yeah, so I think that would be it is to, to again, send this back to the drawing board for some further research on that and to, insofar as there are, they should be consistent across commissions. Okay, so now. Do you mind if I just, I'm sorry, it's Sheree. Yeah, By the ahead. same token, we as a group did two months ago come to the table saying we wanted to institute. Yes. So right. we might not be looking for one that is the same. You know, we are unique. Oh, right, we, right. So that cuts both ways. We just need to be careful right. about that. Okay, we'll see if we can craft this to take account of that. Thanks. Uh, okay, so I have some, I basically now have a list of uh, general comments that I got that didn't fit specifically into anything here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to share the document with those comments. <clears throat> uh, let's see, there we go. So the, the general comment that most folks shared with me is that the ordinance is too detailed, that it should offer broad sto strokes with details and individual policies to allow flexibility. Um, the second is that the city attorney because of the conflict of interest, this is the reason we have conflict counsel and where counsel is needed that in appropriate places, the ordinance should reflect our reliance on the conflict counsel for guidance. Um, in general, the general point that the ordinance should support transparency to the extent permitted by law. Um, and then to, uh, uh, just one sec. I'm going to skip this one because it's redundant um, and have a typo. The final ordinance or existing policies should be clear that the commission has the authority to review and provide input on the police department's discipline matrix. This may be something, Anthony, that, you know, as you indicated, is already um, accounted for by the authority given us and it may not be necessary. So I've added it there. And if it's not necessarily, we can remove it. Um, and in general, the point that this contradicts existing uh, legislation and um, the, the resolution that the city council set. And so these are some points here. These last four, five or six things are aspects of the city council resolution that were not integrated into this ordinance. And uh, it would just be a signal for us to uh, you recommend that those components of the uh, city council resolution be incorporated in the ordinance. That's it. That's a lot. <laughs> so I think that if I might, I, I, uh, I'm going to suggest the following, that we go around to each commissioner and uh, just share your thoughts on this. If you have anything to add, if there's anything that you disagreed with, that's fine. Just let us know. And if we could do this one by one, would that be okay with everybody? Mm -hmm. All right, uh, Susie's at the top of my list here. So, and I'm going, so I'm gonna call on Susie first. <clears throat> if I might just say one thing, I'm so sorry before you start Susie. And I, I wanna think, say that I think also one thing that we would want to do in this memo is to, um, you know, uh, appreciate the fact that there is this expanded guide, this guidance that um, delineates our mandate in a more uh, detailed way than has been in the past. And so that there are portions of this that are very helpful uh, and that we appreciate the work that has been done on this. So I want it just in terms of framing our comments on this. Susie, go ahead. So in, in relation to fra framing comments, we might wanna have a short piece that affirms what we got from city council 
Mm -hmm. um, I gave you some of that language um, this afternoon. Mm -hmm. Outside of that, I think you know that this is a living document and it's gonna be an ongoing negotiation. Um, and I think we have, it's solid. That's all I have to say. I agree with everything we talked about. We actually did that as we went through. Mm -hmm. I'm done. Okay, Jabu, you're next. Yeah, uh, well, first off, um, thank you for compiling, um, <laughs> hurting us cats in, in this direction and getting this document together. Um, it's really quite impressive. I don't have, I really don't have anything else to, to offer that has been stated here already. Um, I mean, I'm going to give you another look over in the, the next day or two, but I, as of right now, I don't have anything else I could really add on to this. I think um, you captured um, everyone's comments pretty well, and it seems like people agree with that. So uh, as of right now, I'm, I'm quite happy with this. And uh, again, thank you for putting this together. Great. Shereen? Thanks, Stephanie. You were very solicitous in letting me speak during the meeting, and you and I spent a fair amount of time on the phone today going through this. So I feel like um, the things that I was wanting to discuss came out, and, and thank you for that. And I agree with you that I, I am grateful for this document. Um, it really is getting us started on what I think will be um, a good outcome. It might just take a while to get there, but this is a good step forward. So thanks, and thanks for the work on what you're putting together. I appreciate it. Sure. Kevin. Yeah, so um, I actually like all the changes that people suggested. Um, overall, I, I think it's a solid uh, um, piece of work here. And, you know, I don't have any additional <laughs> things to okay. add to it. I like, uh, like I'm going to do the same as uh, Jabu and, and go over it again, um, as I ha already have a couple of times on this document. So it's nice to hear everybody's opinions and suggestions. So just good work. Good work from everybody. Great. Uh, Milo. Thank you. Um, I, I can see some of the good that was mentioned, but I have to admit that initially I was blinded by some of the bad. <laughs> um, a big concern that I have, and I would ask, you know, of the mayor and of the city attorney's office to be very careful of supporting any type of language that maintains a status quo that we know is, is not acceptable um, in terms of that language around, oh, uh, doing what's common in munis uh, other municipalities. That to me was, uh, I was just kind of stunned by, well, I guess I shouldn't be surprised by anything at this point, but I was pretty surprised. And I took that to be um, a way to stop progress. And there were a couple other things that I felt were were put to, to stop or set back progress that we were making, especially um, responding to um, things that the community has asked for in terms of really, truly increasing transparency and really, truly trying to make a difference um, to people, especially pe people that submit complaints. Uh, so overall, um, I'm glad we have this discussion. I'm glad this discussion is public. And um, I'd also like to thank Stephanie for uh, summarizing um, all of our feedback. Thank you. Great. Susie. One other addition, I think, to the preamble is exactly um, what Milo was saying. You know the, the 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 continuous loud voice of the community um, for justice, and that that is our primary responsibility is to be responsive and to be in a situation of advocacy for the community to give that community voice. And that community is is widespread. There's many different groups that comprise this. So thank you for that, Milo. Great. Wow. Uh, Anthony, do you have any thoughts? And Haley, both uh, happy to hear any thoughts or comments you might want to make at this point. Thank you, Stephanie. Well, I just have to express how impressed I am by the commission um, for the thoughtfulness with which you've engaged the process. Um, 
looking at ordinance language is something that we lawyers do all the time. And I know some of you are lawyers or law adjacent. Um, but um, I think the 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 insights that have been shared um, show that uh, this group is really engaged with the task. Uh, in trying to help you channel these comments in a way that's most constructive to advance the dialogue, the only thing I I think we it's important for us to keep in mind is in the resolution itself, when it talks about what should and shouldn't be in the ordinance, there is an important qualifier. And that, and, and that qualifier is what was given in the charge to the city attorney's office to the extent possible consistent within legal constraints. So we do have to appreciate that we're stuck with the charter that I think the commission as a group and many in the community feel, and certainly many in the city council feel, um, is not representative of the end state we're driving toward, but it is where we are. But I also don't think that means the commission needs to necessarily accept um, conventional interpretations of what those legal constraints are. So I think it is important to look with fresh eyes at the charter, to look with fresh eyes at state statutes that the charter is um, has to be consistent with. And um, I've done a little of that research, particularly with regard to um, this section of state law, section 24, BSA 1931, and sort of what authority that gives the police chief and what authority that gives the uh, municipality, the legislative body of the municipality. And it's very clear in the Supreme Court's uh, case law, it's shared authority. Um, so I think we really need to both appreciate the, the task that the city attorney's office has and sort of identifying constraints and working within them, but not be afraid to ask more probing questions about, is that truly a legal constraint or is that just the conventional wisdom of what the legal constraint has been over time? Thanks, that's really helpful. I appreciate that. Haley, do you wanna, do uh, you have any thoughts for us, uh, comments? I mean, I just, I echo Anthony, you know, you as a group have had to do what the ordinance committee effectively does all the time. And if you've ever had the pleasure of sitting in on an ordinance committee meeting, you know that it's, it is, uh, it's, it's making law and it's getting to the, to the end point and it, it's a lot of moving parts. So I think as a, as a first sort of bite at the apple for this group, I, I think the feedback is, is really well taken. Um, I've taken a lot of notes here tonight. I'll, I'll look forward to seeing the more formalized memo, but it definitely has given me some things to think about as, as well as take back to the office when we continue to, to work and tweak and perfect this draft. And also I think too, you know, um, Anthony raised some great points for you to think about in terms of, um, you know, what this ordinance is, is really trying to do is walk right up to the edge of what the charter allows, knowing that, you know, ultimately for the commission, it's, it's not necessarily, um, you know, it, it's not the ideal, but just recognizing the reality that we're within and how we can kind of work with what we have, so to speak, to make it the most um, in line with the commission's current priorities while still respecting those boundaries. Um, and so I think, you know, just having that sort of framework to think about and understanding, you know, okay, why some of the some of at least the meat and bones of the proposals in here are the way they are, I think will really help to orient the thinking, um, not only of this group, but also of, of the, the city council as this continues to move towards um, finalization. So I'm looking forward to the memo. If there's anything I can do to assist, you always know where to find me and it's, it's great that you've got Anthony on board as well to help with some of these niche issues. Great, thank you. That's it on this agenda item, Jibu. I see, I, sorry, I see Milo's hand raised. Uh, oh, Milo. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say something about uh, the almighty charter. I think part of the pieces to this process is to 
not look at that charter as as a hindrance. There are things in that charter that are quite frankly archaic and need to be changed. So I'm not fully aware of exactly how that would work. I'm sure it has to go through the city council, but somewhere along the line, there's going to need to be a process to Mm -hmm. address the archaic and outdated things in that charter. And not simply say, well, we can only go as far as, 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 as this charter will allow us to. Yeah, we can do that right now, but that shouldn't just be it. We have to, we have to address the things in that charter. That's not only interfering with what Burlington's trying to do. That's interfering with what other municipalities in the state of Vermont are trying to do. Um, so we just have, we have to be real about that. There's just shockingly archaic things in that charter um thank you great thanks i second that motion um my understanding is that the charter change committee is will be working on a revision of the charter that was part of this it's a complex i mean there's a complex process going on here we're revising the ordinance the bpoa contract is being negotiated and there will be an effort to change the city charter. So there are a lot of different moving parts and sequencing those is one of the challenges here. Um, In some ways, it would have been better to have the BPOA contract renegotiated and the charter change before changing this ordinance. Uh, But we've been asked to do this. And so uh, I think we just respond to it in this way. Well, it looks to me like it's going to take a while anyway, so it may end up being synchronous. Uh huh. Uh-huh. Right. Uh, okay. Uh, Anthony, I see your hand raised. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, I, ju- I just wanted to respond to Milo's excellent comment with a little bit of additional information. Any charter change also has to be approved by the state legislature. So to the extent that commissioners and other folks in the community that they're working with Um, are in touch with what uh, Milo referred to as other municipalities wanting to do, like very important to build those connections um, for advocacy because the legislature, you know, the legislature and the governor, unfortunately, because the governor has to approve of charter changes, has really been frustrating a lot of things that progressive things, small p progressive, I know, I know you sensitive in Burlington about uh, those labels, but small p progressive changes um, that different municipalities have wanted to make. So looking ahead to the kind of charter changes that Milo is talking about, you know, build your networks across the state because it's not unfortunately just up to Burlington voters. It's up to the representatives from every municipality as well as the governor as to what can go through even if the city and all its voters decide on a charter for change. So that activism for change starts now and it goes broader than just the borders of uh, the city of Burlington. Great. Um, I have a process question for Jabu. Yep. So we're gonna try to finalize the, a memo uh, based on the discussion tonight. Mm-hmm. When is the latest that we can post it to board docs? I actually don't know that answer. Um, oh, Haley. I, I might go. have to, I was going to redirect <laughs> to Haley, sorry. So this is for your regular meeting on Tuesday, correct? Mm-hmm. So for the regular meetings, we generally try to have those posted 48 hours in advance. Um, that's under the open meeting law. So ideally, we would get that to Shannon for posting on Friday. If it's really a tight turnaround, I what... Um, she could do is just put that agenda item, placeholder item saying, you know, memo forthcoming. Um, And I think it would be okay to sort of fill in the placeholder item with the finalized memo on Monday. Um, But, but certainly as far as the agenda is concerned, that's, that's definitely something to be posted um, by close of business on Friday. Great. I think we're all set to do that just in case there's any slippage uh, it's good to know that we have until Monday. Great. No problem. Uh, Mila, I'm sorry. I I think you're, you were about to jump in there for a second. Yeah, I just, um, it, it, the whole like 
small p progressive some of this isn't progressive it's it's literally correcting something that is just outdated that's just outdated and that we um and also addressing some things that assumptions that were made when you look at some of the powers that are given specifically to a position of police chief well there was a, an assumption made at the time that police chiefs were always going to do the right thing when in fact all over the state there's been a number of issues so it's 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 literally looking at a document the things in it the age of the things in it and 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 what our our current contemporary realities are so some of it isn't really progressive it's just it's just fixing things that are that are no longer um accurate for for what we're dealing with today thank you thank you yeah i'm sorry if i misspoke i i meant the term progressive in making progress and i think correcting past wrongs is how i intended it and I view correction of past wrongs as progress. Okay. Thank you. And I wasn't criticizing you in any way. Um, I was just saying that there's, that there's things that, I guess I don't have the, the correct way to, to really say it but it's it's with everything that they have to do looking at a document that is been kind of a settled document for such a long time isn't a priority so we all have to work together to say hey this needs to be a priority so that we can we can move forward and correct systematic issues that we're facing thank you <clears throat> Just as a friendly amendment, and I don't want to continue this conversation too much longer because I'm falling asleep over here, but embedded in every settled thing is power. And that's what we're really facing in this whole situation is power, you know, at every level. Um, the document that we received, in my humble opinion, was incredibly um, encroaching on the things that this commission has been trying to do for the last, you know, at least as long as I've been on it, which is almost a year now. So that's all. And I still feel like I hardly know anything. <laughs> all right, then. Um, I'm not, I think that concludes that agenda item. Um, any further comments or questions anybody has? You guys are amazing. Thank you. Right back at you. Um, before I motion to adjourn the meeting, I'm quickly going to say, Stephanie, uh, Stephanie and I are about ready, are just about done finalizing the agenda. If you have any agenda items you want to add on there, please get it to us by the end of the day tomorrow so we can get Shannon um, the agenda Monday morning so, so it can be posted and warned properly. Oh, sorry, um, uh, Chair, Co Chair Kamash, I just to the extent I wasn't clear before, the agenda itself needs to be posted by close of business on Friday. Mm -hmm. And yeah. as long as there is an agenda item saying memo to be discussed, if the commission needs to supplement the agenda on Monday by adding the memo, that's I think that's totally fine. But the agenda needs to be posted and warned 48 business hours in advance. Awesome. Thank Sorry. you for the clarification. <laughs> no, no, quite all right. I appreciate the clarification. Um, so, all right, yeah. Um, yeah, please, uh, any agenda items uh, you want want added to the agenda, please get, us, get that to Stephanie and myself by the end of the day tomorrow. So, uh, yes, we can post that for Monday. Sorry, post that for Friday morning. Apologies. And with that, I motion to adjourn the meeting. Do I have a second? Seconded by Susie. Sorry, her hand was for Esther, Stephanie. Uh, and everybody in favor of adjourning the meeting, raise your hand to say aye. 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 Passes unanimously. It is 7.34 p.m. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here with us. Thank you for members of the public for joining us. 
Our next scheduled meeting is Tuesday, uh, this coming Tuesday, which is the 26th. Um, it'll be a remote meeting, so you can join us via Zoom, and that will be posted on Friday. Everybody have a good rest of the work week. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Anthony. All right, we'll be Bye. in touch. Thank you. Yeah.